Okay, afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we're really excited to have this discussion. Um, and, and I've just been saying with some of our clients how I feel like we've been talking about disruption. Disruption is coming and we've kind of been preachers of digital doom for insurers. But I think we can all agree, especially with COVID, how um, you know the, the talk around digital transformation has really accelerated. And if there ever was a need for insurers to really uh, think about and reflect how ready they are for digital disruption. Yesterday was the best time to do so, and today is the next best time. So hopefully you'll get some good insight and food for thought in our discussion. So we'll start off with setting the scene, um, and then we'll share a bit of research that we've done in an African context. We'll then talk about how do you actually go about uh, your digital transformation journey, and then we'll talk about the importance of culture and strategy, which sometimes is, is left as an afterthought, but is one of the most important aspects of embarking successfully on the digital transformation journey. Okay, so as, as, as I mentioned in setting the scene, let's talk about how uh, you know the digital trajectory has sort of happened or moved in the last few years. So if you think of our mobile devices, yesterday I lost my phone and felt almost like my world fell apart, couldn't do anything. Like we're so interconnected um, with, uh, with our devices and if you look at the number of connected devices uh, that are currently in the world, they've actually outnumbered the world's population since 2008. And uh, 2050, they're expected to have around 50 billion interconnected devices. So you can see how the pace at which the world is moving towards this digital, digitally enabled world is constantly and rapidly moving. And so the most digital organizations really are constantly looking for new ways and strategies to use emerging technologies and enable them in further embarking successfully in becoming digitally focused organizations. Okay, but what does digital transformation mean really? Right? It, digital transformation is not technology. It's not automating a process, right, as we would like to think of it. It really is a mindset. Um, and it's putting the customer at the center of it all. Right? So it's not about digitizing your existing processes, uh, and that's what we hear a lot of you know, companies say they're doing, which is good, but that's just a very you know, small element of this entire uh, journey of becoming a digitally transformed business. And it's using technology to do so. So you have your employees, you, know, you need to think about what, what is your strategy in transforming and upskilling your employees, which is one of the key elements of why insurers have really struggled in becoming a digitally transformed organization. Um, data and systems, your products, uh, strategy needs to be, needs to have that um, digital focus. Uh, and like I mentioned, the customer really, that customer experience is centered to it all. And I think Ash was mentioning in a meeting we had yesterday how the companies that are really succeeding in digitizing themselves are the ones who are thinking about what they do from a service perspective. As opposed to we sell a product, we're actually providing a service and how can we elevate the service and experience to the customer, especially in this age where um, Gen Zs are increasingly becoming you know, more and more prevalent in terms of the customer base that we serve. So let's look at different industries and which industries are leaders, which ones are laggers. So as Deloitte, we've, uh, we have a global uh, digital maturity database, and we used the data from that database to map out where the different industries are and which ones are setting the pace. So I'm sure for, for most of us in the room, it's not surprising to see um, consumer-focused uh, industries, Google, the Amazons of this world uh, at the front, and as you can see, unfortunately, insurance, the insurance industry on average um, is more of a lagger. 
one thing I would like to note here is quite interestingly, banking and finance, which is you know part and parcel of the overall financial services industry in which insurance is, is much further ahead the curve uh, than the insurance industry, and we'll talk about why that is the case. Uh, and you know, like I mentioned, this is on average, so there might be some companies that are further ahead than their counterparts in the industry in which they operate, and some that are a bit behind. But why does insurance, or why does the insurance industry continue to struggle to to move, um, uh, you know, in pace, or or to be more of a pace setter, um, or to to move faster in their digital transformation journey? So we all know, and I'm sure we've all experienced the regulatory burden of working in an insurance company, right? And so by nature, insurance is very much compliance-based, right? A lot of the things that we do, even as actuaries, the first thing we're thinking of is more on the risk of a side of is this compliance, is this the right thing to do, right? Whereas the leaders in digital transformation are very much risk takers. They actually embrace failure. For them, failure is is how they actually do things well, and they use the data and the learnings from their failures to do well. Whereas with insurance, we're very much more compliance led compliance focused, and we have that more risk averse nature. Um, of course, the skill set is, is also you know, a challenge. And think about one year ago, uh, most of us in the room probably didn't even know that chat GPT exists. But look at how it has changed the way we see the world, the way we do things in less than 12 months. And so, you know, leadership and, and being able to upskill ourselves in, in, in becoming more digitally focused is a key challenge in, in the industry. And so, of course, even thinking more from a product-centric uh, focus to more of a customer centric focus is also another key challenge and reason why insurers continue to, to lag behind. Driven of course by some of the other you know existing challenges around technology systems. Uh, if you look at the insurance spend and think about if you work in an insurance company, most of the insurer most of the technology spend or amount spent on tech right now is on fixing issues with legacy Right? Fixing issues um, with systems that are not working, integrations that keep on breaking down. Uh, and so those are some of the challenges we've seen that are bar uh, barriers for insurers to be able to transform themselves um, digitally. So let's look at the insurance industry itself and talk more about who is winning the digital race. So, not all players within the industry are lagging as it relates to digitization. Uh, and again, I'm sure it comes with no surprise that the insurtechs uh, are the leaders uh, in, in digitization. Telco operators as well, globally, are using their platforms, right, are using their platforms to be able to provide that elevated experience, but also be able to um, adopt or work within an, an agile environment that is required so that you can rapidly iterate, you know, even as you have those failures, iterate your product development. Um, one of the key uh, metrics that I used in, in digital transformation is how quickly can you bring a product from ideation to the market? And if you can't do that as an insurer within three months, obviously there's, again, compliance issues and barriers then you need to think about you know, whether what you say in terms of your digital transformation is really working and how you can uh, work around becoming even more agile. Okay, then bank insurers, again, uh, ahead of, of the traditional insurers. Uh, and I think it's also because of you know, the nature of how bank insurance started. Obviously, it's a riff off of traditional insurer. But again, they haven't been bogged down as much by traditional legacy systems and some of the challenges that I've already shared with you. So let's do a case study of a traditional incumbent insurer because it is possible to disrupt yourself as, as, an, as an insurer with an established business. It's not easy, it's very difficult, but it is possible. 
So some of you may have uh, heard, uh, maybe even worked or interacted with people who've worked at this company. So Generali is a typical Italian insurer, uh, operates in multiple geographies, over 60 million, uh, uh, over 60 million customers. And they went on a digital transformation journey. But it was a long journey, tough, uh, but they managed to do it successfully and disrupted themselves at the core, which Ash will talk about more with you all. So it all started in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Their profits tanked uh, significantly. Uh, they were quite highly leveraged uh, and really affected by the financial crisis of 2008. So uh, they went on, you know, a strategy to sort of transform, um, transform themselves as it relates to their operations, uh, let go of some of the, uh, the geographies that were not part of their core, uh, core business operations, also went through uh, a restructuring program. Uh, 2010 improved a bit, but then 2011 again, uh, they, they struggled with uh, their profitability. So in 2012, they went on uh, a three-year turnaround strategy and really started to think about how are we going to turn this ship around there. They were a typical case of an insurer that felt, you know, that had this false sense of we're too big to fail, you know, as one of the largest global insurers in the world. Uh, so they go on this turnaround strategy and uh, they start to really think about how are they going to make their operations more efficient? How are they going to elevate and, and improve on the customer experience? Uh, and they started working uh, you know, in close uh, partnership with uh, consultants to help them in transforming their business in all these different areas. They also had a change in leadership. Uh, that helped them in becoming even more focused on their key strategic initiatives. And in 2018, uh, they refreshed their strategy and one of the very key uh, focuses or refinements that they made was really in the customer focus. And, and they made the customer the center of everything they did. And they talked about, they called it the lifetime partner. And so everything they did from anyone in operations to anyone in sales to anyone in, in, in compliance, risk, whatever, they needed to adopt this you know, refined culture of making their customers their lifetime partner. How can we elevate this partnership? You know, how can we make sure that our customers stay with us for life? And so, you know, I've not even talked about you know, digital applications or whatever, which is what they use to enable them to, to make this strategy come to life, but it wasn't the core focus, right? Technology, they used it to enable their strategy, but the core focus was on elevating and making their customers uh, lifetime partners. And so in, in 2020, obviously accelerated by COVID and you know, the need for, for all of us to, to have changed how we did business, they further accelerated uh, some of the digital uh, initiatives that they had started around uh, you know, um, pay as you go and all these other uh, interesting uh, ways of doing insurance uh, digitally. Uh, fast forward to 2023, they've had the best operating results and net profits ever. They've been given multiple awards globally uh, on being a leading innovator in the insurance space. And I think this just goes to show that it is possible. But as you can see, it was a long journey. You know, it's, it's not something that uh, you're going to do today and come up with a strategy and one year's time you'll be reaping the benefits. Uh, it takes a lot of, of effort. It takes a lot of willingness and that cultural change and shift and mind shift is really important uh, as part of this journey and be, being able to successfully transform yourself uh, as a traditional insurer. Okay, so I'll hand over to Ash who will now talk about what's next and what are the challenges and some of the insights uh, we've seen from the surveys uh, we've done from an African context.
Good, thanks everybody, and uh, sorry about shifting this presentation out. Um, so as Rebecca's given you the context of the industry, um, she's given you the context of how uh, exam there are examples, real life examples of uh, players that have actually shifted uh, their business trajectory. Um, I'd like to just sort of talk to you about um, some of the surveys we've done, clients that we've worked with, well, this, uh, the next few sort of slides that I talk to are actually an amalgamation of the experience we've got in working with insurers that are looking to transcend their current business model uh, to becoming far more uh, digital. And um, I know digital is a bit of a buzzword, but you can see from this uh, previous slide that Rebecca shared, um, generally started that journey back in 2005, whenever it was. But we're in 2023. It's not, a, it's not an easy journey. It's not a... Um, short journey, but it is a, definitely a worthwhile journey to keep businesses uh, like yours uh, in this sector that requires transformation, that needs transformation to be sustainable. So we, uh, we, we sort of started to engage our clients and uh, people, you know, businesses across the continent, whether it's South, Southern Africa, East Africa, as well as West Africa. So this is a representative sample. We obviously can't share the details, but we've pulled out some of the key highlights. We specifically asked, what are some of the key challenges uh, insurers face uh, in, in making that transition happen? Uh, and I think that's useful to share here because I feel that as actuaries, uh, we often have uh, hidden powers in the sense um, decision makers look to actuaries for comfort and uh, acknowledgement of whether the decisions they're making are sensible. And I think there's an opportunity for this, the, our profession to uh, be, continue to be good at what we're good at, but also learn to perhaps uh, take a different perspective on how we can enable our business colleagues to take more risks, uh, more calculated risks. Because I suspect most of us are far better at saying no <laughs> than saying yes. And I think what I'm trying to encourage us to think about is that I think we have a duty to the future sustainability of the businesses we work for and therefore our industry to show how can business leaders take more decisions. Um, and so I think what I'd like to end with is really like with some of the what some of the thinking around well what can be done differently. Okay? So that's really how insurance can progress their digital readiness. Um, Alright, so I think I've spoken to this slide a bit, uh, but let me just uh, uh, sort of highlight some of the key points. Uh, we, had, we undertook a survey across a number of clients, some of them are ours, some of them are not clients of ours, but you know, leading players. This is, by the way, an evolving database of information, as Rebecca pointed out, a good global database across uh, different territories, different sectors. But specifically on the continent, we've engaged with 16 leadership teams. Um, and those leadership teams are are represented by all the major functions of an organization, sales, distribution, technical, finance, operations, etc. So we've got a good spectrum. The one thing I will say um, for those that are probably sort of more cynical in mind, that I think what we have found is that because of engaged leadership, we probably have a, a leadership bias, right, in terms of feedback. What we, what we need to do is build on this, and, we, and this is an open uh, survey that we could encourage more organizations to, to contribute to uh, because there is the benefit of getting some feedback. But, but as you go further into the, uh, the, 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 the coal face of the organization, I think you get some ground realities that oftentimes senior leaders um, don't get to see because they get to see the summarized view. So that's probably just the only caveat I put out there. But we have some significant um, organizations that are representative. So, so I think there's still some good learnings that, that can come out and then perhaps uh, take away to each of us. So, so digital readiness uh, is really just a, a, an expression of how, how enabled uh, is your business um, to take on the opportunities uh, of a constantly evolving uh, customer landscape. Uh, Rebecca's touched upon a lot of issues. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting for me, you know, I haven't sort of, you know, in the last four days that I've been here in Kenya and just in my life back in South Africa and elsewhere, you know, I, I live off this phone and everything is so accessible off the phone. 
It's just an example. The phone has got the, the end destination, perhaps. But it's just an example that actually, ultimately, we have been so um, in, ingrained in our engagement as customers um, uh, getting an Uber. It's, everything's on the app. Um, and so the point I'm trying to make is that even in this room, you are all customers of other industries. Even your experiences and your expectations of a financial services business is informed by how other industries are influencing how we engage with them. So if today, the contrasting experiences, I can actually get an Uber within three seconds, I know who my driver is, I know he knows exactly where he's taking me, he knows what route, and um, I know how much I'm going to pay him. Um, but then I come into insurance and I've got to sit with an agent and fill out 15 forms and then he's got to explain everything and he's got to have three meetings and that, I mean that's just an exceptionally contrasting experience. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, digital readiness is about how are we as an industry or how is your organization ready to engage with customers um, that have that experience. And I think it's a fallacy for us as um, professionals to think, oh, well, you know, that's just like the young people, which is most of you in this room, right? Um, but, but, but actually, interestingly, interestingly so, all of our research has shown that across all generations, you have an element of this digital journey that customers want. So in the older generation, they're used to an advisor, agent, filling out forms. They still prefer to have a human interaction but they have the ability and need to, to undertake some of their experiences digitally. It might swing the other way with, um, with most of you, where you want to, want to have, have everything on your phone. So that digital readiness is that's what it's describing. And the best way to measure digital readiness is through a uniform measure. And so we've, we've developed through the years a maturity scale that is very simple uh, in presentation, but complex behind the scene. But you have organizations that have started exploring. But here, the organization is really automating existing processes. That's really automation, uh, a, bit, a bit to what uh, Rebecca said earlier on. All the way to the extreme right of this curve is, is our organizations that are actually, they, they are being digital. And I think, uh, I don't know how much you may have experienced, heard, read, or seen. But I'd like to take an example of a business that I think we're all familiar with, and that's Google. And if you just, in your own mind, you know, think through uh, maybe some Hollywood movies that have been you know, you know, made around businesses like Google, or what you might have read, your own experiences, well, that business is truly being digital. Because everything that they are doing is they are creating the, the business environment, the cultural environment, the empowerment, the technology to adapt um, to evolving needs. Rebecca's curve of mobile adoption is just an example. The evolution of customer needs is rapidly changing. And if that business was not rapidly changing itself and adapting itself in terms of embracing new technology, embracing new feedback, new data, and evolving their model, um, they would not be relevant and they'd be overtaken by others. Um, and the real question I have for, you, for all of us as an industry, as professionals, is how adaptable are our organizations? I think it takes a long time for us to make decisions. Um, so uh, what's interesting, though, is we shouldn't really be too that hard on ourselves. Because I think lots of good things have happened since, 20, well, since COVID. We've had to do different things. But often what we found is um, we responded to the external challenges. And the way we responded was to sort of take um, incremental steps. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with taking incremental steps. But I think what we've done as an industry is that we've got into this illusion of, of thinking we're digital because we've developed a few apps, or we've automated a few processes, or we might have, you know, trans you know, transform part of our organization to the cloud. I think those are all excellent things that we should be congratulating ourselves for, but it shouldn't stop there because just think about how long it took the organization to respond to that. But the, the pace of response needs to continue. Uh, the pace of response needs to continue to, to evolve and change. And so we find that organizations that are um, like excited about the next shiny app 
or the next shiny tool are actually creating an illusion for themselves because that's where they get stuck. They keep getting stuck in this virtual circle of new development. And the real thing is you've got to transform the way you think about customers, the way your leadership culture and culture embraces the potential for failure. It's not that you structure yourself for failure, because you structure yourself for success, but when there is failure uh, in a particular initiative, it's our response is typically you know, a little bit more um, sort of compliance driven than you know, what went wrong and you know, uh, why did it go wrong. The reality is the questions we should be asking is what did we learn from this going wrong? So that we can do the next pilot with more confidence, as opposed to never doing another pilot of something. Okay, so that's really where um, I think the the, the 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 sort of rating scale comes from. Uh, sorry, Rebecca spoke about Generali, and uh, as an example, that institution has taken 20 odd years to genuinely go from exploring stage to to being uh, between becoming and being. And uh, I don't think, you know, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever get to that being stage, but I think it's a great holy grail to aim for. Uh, aim big and, you know, you, you'll get close to it. Um, as we said, that through the survey that we've done, talking to our clients uh, and the markets, uh, there is a spectrum. You know, it's not as if that our industry is not, um, you know, is not progressing. So I think that's really important to, say, to note. But what is interesting is the reason why we think on average we're actually stuck in this, um, this phase of doing rather than fully transforming our business, is that less than 10% of the respondents, we have over, over 150 respondents across these organizations, say that they don't have uh, more than 25% of their business coming from digital transactions. Um, and that might, our traditional response to that is that because most of our people or customers actually want to speak to an agent, that's what's manual. I don't believe that. Um, there are some very, very good examples of businesses that have started on the continent, some being short techs. They might not be growing uh, as uh, to the scale that uh, you know, some of the existing incumbents are, but the pace at which they are transacting, not just onboarding, uh, not just quotations, not just policy issuance, not just uh, customer queries, not just you know notification of claim and claim settlement and claim fulfillment, not across the entire journeys uh, from a customer perspective and even from an internal perspective, those journeys are becoming far more digital. And um, the benefits are there because once you have that base of digital capability, um, what happens is that you have to scale because that the, the, it's not just the technology, but the people that are in the business are thinking of innovative ways of digitizing their business for the purpose of delivering value. And not just delivering value for the shareholder, but delivering value for the shareholder through delivering value for the customer. Because if we can get that right for the customer, um, more customers will come and those customers will buy more. So I think that's the key thing here. Um, so just to give you a sense of where we got the averaging um, of, where, of why we believe our industry is currently in the doing phase, although there is a spectrum, is that um, across the five pillars that we chose, or that we use uh, in, in measuring digital maturity, uh, we're almost at all of them um, uh, at the 50% mark, which is where the doing scale uh, really is. So whether it's technology, which is your naming layer, whether it's your operations, whether these are sort of self-optimizing capabilities, um, whether it's your customer lens, which is how, how, to what extent are you um, sort of proactively getting the customer involved in your product design, service design, feedback, um, to what extent is your strategy digitally led. Um, those four are definitely doing, doing uh, level. Uh, whereas culture and leadership is, is actually a bit more progressed and it's becoming. And I did say earlier on that we might have a leadership bias here because this question is largely about how you know, strong is the culture and how strong is the leadership around digital. So we did have the senior execs responding, so they certainly feel that they're actually doing a good job. So I'd love to see the response as this evolves when more people uh, in the organization lower down and respond. But we'll, we'll build on that. But I still think it's worth uh, you know, talking about this. So I'll take each of the, the pillars very quickly. And I have generally, genuinely summarized 
um, some of the key highlights. Again, there was a lot more detail behind this, so to the time we've given, this is all we could really sort of talk to. But ultimately, um, one of the parameters under this technology lens is to what extent is our, our respondents and is the industry um, able to convert a data into value? Because, because we sit on an incredible amount of data, um, assuming we collect it and store it properly, but um, out of the 16 Pan-African organizations we've spoken to, only one organization reported that they have mature business analytical capabilities in the form of, um, you know, they're able to make better underwriting decisions, even though they're operating in a largely market-driven pricing, uh, as opposed to risk-driven pricing uh, environment, but they're making better decisions. Um, even, even to the point that they're making uh, more informed decisions around their agents being able to uh, manage their performances to being far more proactive around which agents are likely to not perform versus having a retrospective approach. So far more predictive approach. Um, so that's only one organization out of 16 um, that can do that. Um, and equally, um, one of the things we found is that um, we are quite risk averse in our thinking around the ability, our ability to share our data. Yes, there is a you know, the protection of personal information in all of our countries that we operate in. But the interesting thing is that I think our natural reaction is to then comply and not do anything with it. Whereas other industries or people that are actually changing it and challenging is say, well, okay, we understand that this is the regulation environment. Their question becomes, well, how can we? As opposed to, no, we can't. They ask that question. And when you start asking the how can we question given these limitations, it really start, makes you pause and think about how can we leverage our data and share our data. And the sharing of data is not for the purpose of giving trade secrets away, but it's for the purpose of being able to share data into your organization so that you can partner better, so you can grow faster with other organizations, and likewise share your data with other capability or service providers so that you can then bring in better services. Because an insurer, we, we serve our customer through a product. But, but, but the customer experience is not just the product, it's the, it's the combination of product and service. And if we can't build those services, you need to, to bring those services in. So sharing your data is a very critical measure of maturity. Um, <laughs> Somebody please keep uh, a time check, because I'm, I'm very passionate about this, so I'll keep talking. Um, legacy systems and architecture. Um, I think this is, uh, as we said, both Rebecca and I said that we, we all accept that digitization cannot happen without the right technology, but it is genuinely a foundational enabler. What actually creates the, the change is the mindset in organizations. Uh, but, but just talking about the, 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 the technology, um, less than 21% of our respondents reported that, you know, across all the capabilities that they have, um, only 50% uh, only or more was actually on cloud. Um, so a very small percentage, less than a fifth, says that half or more of their organization is on the cloud, which I think is a good thing. But I think more can be done. And why? Because cloud capability, by accessing the cloud capabilities, be it data, analytics, business intelligence, um, AI, um, you know, other service providers that are on the same cloud as you, 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 know, you might be on, what we're able to do is we're tapping into the global best. We can't develop everything ourselves. We don't need to. As insurers, we've always operated within our value chain. Our reinsurers, ourselves, our distribution, and our customers. That's our, that's been our universe. Our universe needs to be opened up because there's capabilities out there that I think we can leverage far more if we start trying migrating more of our capabilities on the cloud. Um, okay, so I mean the, the second point is exactly the same as the first, but it's just a different way of presenting. But you know, about 40% of our respondents reported that, you know. Half of the organizations are legacy capabilities. And the challenge with legacy capabilities, and let me just describe them, maybe the organizations, you know, I suspect still have legacy capabilities. 
um, whether it's a general ledger of legacy capability, or whether it's a policy administration system. Um, the, the legacy capability uh, environment, I hope this sounds familiar, is that when you need to um, develop a new product or modify an existing product, do you have to, does this sound familiar that, you know, when, when the people who are doing new product design, they'll come up and say, this is the design, and the underwriter says, well, okay, if that's going to happen, we're going to now need this requirement on our system. And then the processing people said, yeah, well, if we're going to have to do that, then we're going to have to develop this, this, and this new capability on the system, because otherwise it's all manual. And the claims person does the same, and the finance person does the same, and the business requirements all come together, and somebody writes it all out. And then we chuck it over to the te technology people, and the technology people look at it and say, okay, we can do this, but we've got to do this first, we've got to do that first, second. You can, we can start your work in three months' time, or six months' time. It's going to take six months. Does that sound familiar? Because that's how you know, we typically do uh, with product development, for example. Well, that's how the legacy systems and insurers work. The new insurers, the digitally enabled insurers, the insure techs don't operate that way. They don't take that very um, sequential approach. They say, well, we've got to do something, and we, we think this is the feedback from our customers, this is our understanding. Let's start co-creating you know, incrementally together, and our legacy system is not what we're going to do this on. We're going to do this on a purely cloud-based, software-as-a-service, no-code systems where you can start incrementally designing and launching incremental versions of this and seeing how the market reacts, then get that feedback, do the next version, do the next version. So that means that it might take six months. By the time you've done six months, you've done about four versions of the product. By the time you get to the six month, you've actually got the final product. In the traditional sense, legacy systems, legacy mindset, legacy processes, it will take 12 months before you launch, and you still haven't tested it one single client. You might have done UAT internally, but not one single client seen it. So you've wasted 12 months of time, and you launch the product, and it fails. Whereas the new way is don't wait for that, co-create, and use new capabilities to help you do so. Um, I'll talk about customer in a minute. Um, similar operations, um, uh, sorry, let's go back. Um, there's not a single business that has spoken about uh, having the capability of um, self-optimization processes. Now this might sound far-fetched, it might sound very futuristic, but the reality is leading organizations, insurers in the world, have actually got in all of their major processes um, self-learning capabilities, machine learning capabilities, so processes that, um, can, you know, uh, within a spectrum or standard deviation for, you know, the, the process, you know, delivers an outcome that's not within the expected, those processes self-inform, and uh, there is some human intervention that you can then go in and fix the root cause of why that standard deviation variation actually happened. Um, but there's not a single player on the continent that's doing that, even some of the big Pan-African guys that are investing a lot in this. Um, I spoke about this uh, product development process. Um, yeah, you know, not, not, not a significant amount of uh, players can say genuinely that they have shifted their product ideation, innovation, and marketing launch process from what I described, which is the sequential, sequential process, to what I've just described is the way, for example, Generali thinks about launching any new product or any new service. Um, okay, so um, from a customer perspective, I think I've spoken quite a bit. Rebecca spoke a lot of what digital transformation in the industry, across industry, is actually centered around the customer. I spoke about my own experience of, you know, and all of your experience of being able to do Uber so quickly and so at the uh, touch of my fingertips and then having to do my insurance policy through a manual process. Okay? So the point is, every business, every industry that is transforming is thinking about what they need to do to adapt and respond to the evolving needs of customers of all generations. Um, and in doing so, um, the leading organizations, for example, like um, Generali, they are hungry, they proactively go out and seek customer feedback. And in fact, they seek, what's interesting about them is they actually seek the negative feedback. Because they know the positive feedback's good, but they go out and look for where social media, blogs, whatever it is, and what did, what did somebody consistently say that was negative? They want to hear that. So bringing that back in is very important. Um, and I think we are good at 
trying to get customer feedback, but it takes us a long time to respond to customer feedback. Like our processes don't change fast enough. Um, and I think that's why I'm saying that it might, we, we, we are doing it, but we're not adapting. The adaptability of our business is actually where the critical mass comes from. Um, so that's the point about real-time responses. Co-innovation, co I mean, I have to say I've been speaking to some really interesting businesses uh, here over the last three, four days, and, and everyone seems to claim to be doing co-innovation. Co well, congratulations, but then um, why is penetration still so low? Um, why is there still, across the continent, there's this mistrust of insurers, or lack of understanding of what it actually does? Because it literally is just a promise of one day I'll pay you. I mean, you know, and there's a piece of paper right, so that supports that promise. Um, so, um, I mean, some of, some practical examples of insurers that we've worked with um, that have had products that have launched but they weren't successful despite adopting this approach and adopting the customer groups, focus groups that were actually in the product design process. Um, who actually, uh, including advisors and agents and intermediaries, who actually understand the customers too. So, so genuinely the question becomes uh, if you can get that process right and still accept that you'll do it, it might, not, it might not succeed to the extent you want it to. That cultural shift of being able to bring customers into your design process for products and services is an incredibly powerful way of understanding and responding and adapting what you do for your customers, um, you know, um, uh, for, for the customers. Um, so again, similar um, organizations that are strong um, and customer uh, engagement, uh, look out and, and actively go looking for sentiments uh, that are expressed. We often get, um, you know, I think in our businesses, we often get in our call center or the emails, uh, you know, the customer query, we, we, we monitor that. So long as we're doing that, that's a good start. But what the next stage is, is that real-time monitoring of who's saying what on social media is, is fantastic. And very few uh, of those people we spoke to, they yes, they track the social media integration, or what I say is from social media, but what they're not able to do is integrate and weave that back into well, what needs to be done differently. And that's the next big thing. Right? If you can get that done right, then you're evolving to, your, to, to the, um, to the uh, needs of customers. Uh, another interesting uh, test or metric that we looked at was um, um, self-service. Right, so not everybody wants to serve themselves because some people want to phone something. I, I like to speak to somebody when I've got a complaint because I like to get my frustration out on them. But, um, um, but you know, not everybody wants to do that. They want to actually serve you know, themselves. But very few organizations have enabled the back-end capabilities to be self-serve. What they have done, what organizations are doing quite well, uh, the, the ones that are, are they're doing the onboarding of customers very well. But then guess what happens? Now this, this client's got, I've got a, I've got a client in, in, in West Africa, and they've done an amazing job at integrating their uh, travel insurance uh, offering uh, with airlines. And um, they've got, you know, by their own admission, they said we've got, we have scaled our business um, multiple fold. We've got, acquired lots and lots of customers, and won lots of positive comments. But when, they, when those customers, who had such an amazing experience of clicking a, a sort of barcode or whatever, a QR code, and the whole process starts, it's within seconds, right? But then they've got a claim. <laughs> and then they have to phone somebody because they can't do the same thing. So then they, they, they've obviously realized that they need to invest in the back end, right? Um, but, but those customers that like to uh, self-serve from an onboarding and a product purchase perspective are probably more likely to want to have you self-serve as well. Um, so you can't have just that being so mature, but the back end is really crap. Excuse the French. Um, so you've got to modernize that too, right? Um, okay, so from a strategy perspective, um, well, this was interesting for us. Uh, quite counterintuitive. So a number of uh, organizations, 71%, sorry, the, the fonts sort of uh, gone for the percentage side, 71% are responded confirmed. <coughs> that their organization have invested in a function called digital and innovation. That's fantastic. 
So we know it's important, which is why we've created roles. But what is interesting is 48% um, of the total respondents said they, they're not aware of a digital strategy. What is interesting is having sort of spoken to some of the respondents who understand this phenomenon, because you wouldn't necessarily have logically a function if you don't actually know what you're going to do with it, right? That's why this was a bit of an anomalous thing. And what was interesting is that um, leadership in itself uh, typically is the CEO, mainly the CFO on the board, and they made some strategic decisions, but around which way they're going. Uh, and yes, they've brought in the rest of the executive team and other leaders, senior leaders to build some business strategy and therefore the digital strategy that underpins it. But that strategy is not well understood. So what this 48% that say they don't have a digital strategy actually is they don't actually fully understand how their digital strategy aligns and supports the business strategy. So what is interesting is that what's happened is business strategies have evolved, this digital strategy then came about, uh, but they've not been aligned because they're not separate, they're actually the same thing. Your business strategy is your primary, your digital strategy is the other thing. So that was quite interesting uh, for us. Um, the other metric which we think is very interesting, I spoke about data sharing and being able to partner for data or services or customers. That requires us as insurers to not just what, think that our universe of players is the reinsurer, us, our brokers, and the agents, and the customer, because actually there's a far bigger universe of suppliers that we can work with, or partners we can work with, to deliver an outstanding customer experience and an outstanding customer value. But we don't have, okay, we don't have that many customer uh, respondents that actually have a platform ecosystem-based strategy. Um, okay. Uh, this is one of the, as I said, it's the anomaly here was that maybe there's a leadership bias in our response. Um, but uh, where generally succeeds is in bringing um, an absolutely adaptive risk entrepreneur, risk taking entrepreneurial culture with the leadership driving those behaviors. And if, if there's anything that you take away from this presentation, there's the one thing I'll say if all of you our current leaders and your teams and your units and all the future leaders is that that execution of a strategy uh, is bound to fail if your strategy has a particular DNA, your leadership has a particular DNA, your organization culture has a particular DNA, and your organization model has a particular DNA. And I'm going to just uh, uh, give you a very quick example. If your strategy says we're going to be the leading disruptor in the insurance sector, it sounds really sexy, doesn't it? And because everybody wants to be that. But then your leadership attributes and behaviors about <coughs> compliance. How do those two marry? Right? So you can say on paper you want to be a disruptor, but if your leadership attributes are not risk taking, entrepreneurial, a willingness to try and learn and fail, and you don't create the same culture, and you don't create your organizational models if they're very traditional and hierarchical because that's how we've always done this at this company, they're not adapted and flat in different ways, encouraging different ways of working, then you create execution gaps. So I would say that's the one key thing is that do not create execution gaps because strategy needs to talk to leadership, that needs to talk to culture, and that needs to talk to model. Okay, so what did Generali do? I don't want to talk to all of these points because Rebecca uh, spoke about that and I'm running out of time. She spoke about a singular purpose. Over these 20 years, they, uh, they got, they, it was a stop-start thing, right? They started, failed, started, failed. But they realized that one thing that they had to get right was a singular purpose that all 10,000 people across many countries were passionate about. And they really, really worked at this singular purpose because it had to mean something to everybody, including the tea lady. Right, who serves the tea at the office, right? She also needed to say that I want to um, be part of this journey and creating lifetime customer value. And her customers were the colleagues that she worked with, for example. Um, I spoke about the, their relentlessness for embracing negative critical feedback. Um, they invested in their people because what we're talking about is a cultural revolution, a, a mindset shift. Now, we've been working a certain way to be transformed to this. We need to learn new skills, and that requires time investment. 
Um, they genuinely um, said, we're going to be an open business, an open architecture business, we're going to partner, because we realize General is good at something, but we're not good at everything, and we need every, every other player to, to participate. But the one thing they got absolutely right was they had a strong implementation plan, right? And I spoke about strategic, uh, strategic execution gaps. They were very cognizant of that, so they got that right. Last two slides, um, in, you know, how, so how can you go about, you know, what are the routes? And I think there's some really interesting learnings from Generali. So the blue circle is your existing business, for example. Uh, on the left-hand side, wherever it is, the, that picture there, uh, where you've got a big core. You know, over a period of time, your, if your business is traditional in mind and, and culture and look, it will grow, right, because the market is growing. But to try and transform that core is really, really, really hard. Generali did not choose that route. What they chose to do was they said, okay, we don't want to disrupt our business because it's okay, we're not making so much money, but it's making money. What we're going to do is we're going to start seeding some disruptive opportunities on the edge. And they started to put a few people in there, bring some new fresh thinking in there, they put some new technology, they, they made the decision making far more risk taking and agile. Um, and they learned from their failures. And what happened is that, that those, those disruption on the edges became bigger and bigger and bigger. So more people went into that, more technology was consumed, more of their business was going in there, more of the value was coming from them. And over a period of time, those disruption on the edges starts overshadowing the core, which is more traditional. But that is how you transform. And so I, I leave you with this last slide because that was what they, they did. Um, and they created some significant capabilities in the center to enable the, 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 the vast organization of 10,000 people across seven or eight countries to genuinely uh, start uh, disrupting at their, their businesses. Because it can't be run from the center, it's got to be driven from the center, but the business units, in this case functions, have to start driving and learning how to start digitizing their capabilities. Excellent. I think that is the last slide, and there's some very good-looking people there um, to end off with. Thank you.